Hey, Bess, are we good to go? Bess, are you there? Hi, Sikube. I've started the webinar, so people are just joining. Um, welcome, everybody. And we'll just keep this slide up for a couple of minutes while we let people join, maybe one or two more minutes. Okay. And then hand over to you, Shikufe. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. My name is Shekufe Zanji. I'm the Global Technical Lead for the Early Childhood Development Action Network. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this webinar on ending corporal punishment in the early years of childhood, an essential right and need of young children that we are co-hosting in partnership with the Global Partnership to End Violence um, and the work uh, and, and, and showcasing one of our knowledge fellows um, and the work he's done on this issue. So with over 1 billion children who experience violence every year with devastating short and long-term consequences for individuals and society, we are seeing that corporal punishment is the most common and widely accepted form of violence against children and most likely to be experienced early in your life. Um, and, which, and, and this has been exacerbated, especially during the pandemic. So it's a really timely issue that we're all gathered here today to discuss. Um, and, this, and through this webinar, we hope to offer you an opportunity to learn more about the prevalence and the impacts of corporal punishment in early life, to hear about some of the global progress towards prohibiting and eliminating corporal punishment in the early years, um, with examples of good practice from Nepal and other places, and to discuss strategies for ending corporal, corporal punishment as a priority for promoting the rights and well being of young children and supporting the development of peaceful and strong societies. Um, so it's really my pleasure to welcome everyone. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. It would be great for you to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know what country you're calling in from. Um, and uh, yeah. 
and it would be great. Uh, Bess, I'm not sure if there's a Q&A function, but it would be great to have um, a Q&A, uh, your questions there, but if not, pop them into the chat. Um, and so with that, I, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Irina Dia, who's the Associate Director of Early Childhood Development at UNICEF, um, to kick us off and give us a framing for why this issue is so important today. So over to you, Irina. Thank you, Shekufe, and greetings, everyone. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm here today to share my thoughts and insights on a topic that's dear to all of us, I'm sure, corporal punishment and its long lasting impact on the child. Now, let's start with what we know. We know that good health, proper nutrition, opportunities for early learning, responsive caregiving and stimulation are all key to promoting child development and well being. However, a safe environment free of violent discipline is as essential. We also know that 250 million children under the age of five in low and middle income countries are at risk of not achieving their full potential. And that represents a high 43%. And it is in part due to the fact that a key component of that equation, the safe and protective environment free of violent discipline is often overlooked and therefore missing from the lives of many children. And emphasis, allow me please to put emphasis on the free of violent discipline element of that protection component, because unfortunately, physical punishment and psychological aggression by parents, caregivers, siblings, are the most common and pervasive forms of violence against children, and most will experience it in their early years. UNICEF data has shown that in six in 10 children aged 12 to 23 months are regularly subjected to violent disciplinary methods. And despite this being a clear breach of children's rights, this routine violence is socially accepted and often considered to be a norm, norm, normal part of growing up. I'm sure the oldest, or maybe I should say the most senior among us today will relate to that. I certainly can, even if I consider myself much luckier than my two older brothers for whom spanking was part of their weekly, if not daily routine. But in my mother's discharge, and she was a wonderful woman, by the way, but in her discharge, she was simply reproducing the model she herself had grown up into and did not know any better. Today, it is no longer an excuse though. Over time, a growing body of scientific research has been able to demonstrate the long-term detrimental impact of violent discipline especially for children in the early years where the brain grows at the pace of seven to 1,000 neural connections per second, a pace that is never achieved again. And toxic stress experienced during that time, that is stress associated with permanent or persistent fear and anxiety, fear and exposure to violence in the family, in school, in a country, can result in abnormalities in the structure and chemical activity of the brain and lead to negative outcomes related to physical, sexual, mental health, adoption of risky behaviors, and subsequent perpetuation of violence in adolescence and adulthood. And there is strong evidence to back up neuroscience. Thanks to that, the widespread practice of violent discipline of children and the need to urgently address it has become a prominent issue on the global agenda. And the presence of so many of us here today is a clear indication of that. For the first time, there's consensus that states have a role in bringing violent discipline to an end. So there are a few things we hope will help us further turn the tide against the use of violent discipline on children. First, there's the fact that the prevalence of violent discipline is one of the key indicators in the sustainable development goals related to violence against children. Indicator which requires states to monitor the percentage of children aged one to 17 who experience any physical punishment and or psychological aggression by caregivers in the past month. That member states have agreed that physical punishment and psychological aggression should be measured suggests consensus that governments have a role ending this practice. As a result, the number of states with legal prohibitions on corporal punishment in the home have been growing exponentially. Today, 63 states have full prohibition of corporal punishment, and 26 others have committed to reforming their laws to achieve complete legal ban. 
There's also growing evidence that parenting programs are cost-effective public health interventions that prevent violent discipline and other forms of maltreatment while promoting optimal child development. More and more, countries are integrating parenting programs in their social services, and these interventions are globally considered building blocks for violence prevention. In 2020, some 87 UNICEF offices supported national efforts to enhance and reinforce positive parenting. At last but not least, there's encouragement in the fact that multi-sectoral ECD programming has begun in more than 115 countries. Extremely encouraging because, as I said at the beginning of my intervention, a combination of factors, including the end of violence and corporal punishment, must be at play to ensure the holistic development of the child. I will stop here for now, and thank you so much for listening, and let's move forward together. Over to you, Shikuthi. Thank you so much, Irina, for kicking us off. Um, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Bess Herbert, the Corporal Punishment Advocacy Specialist at the Global Partnership to End Violence. Um, over to you, Bess. Thank you, Shikuthi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's great to be with you to talk about ending corporal punishment of young children. I am going to just share my slides. Um, so I am going to talk about global progress and delay in prohibiting and eliminating violent punishment of children with a particular focus on the legal dimension. So first of all, what is corporal punishment? It's defined by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child as any punishment in which physical force is used and intended to cause some degree of pain or discomfort, however light. And this can include hitting a child, hitting with an implement, shaking, pinching, biting, forcing a child to stay in a particular position, forcing them to eat something, and the committee also notes that other non-physical forms of punishment can also be cruel and degrading, for example, humiliation, scaring, ridiculing the child. And why should we prohibit and eliminate corporal punishment of children? So the first reason is that it's a human rights obligation. It's within the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which the, almost all states worldwide have committed to and ratified, and therefore it's a commitment that every state bar the United States of America has already made. As Irina mentioned, it's also a development goal. It's included within the SDGs and Agenda 2030 with um, particular targets focused on ending all violence against children. And um, it is also implicated within several other goals within the SDGs, for example, goal three, which is good health and well-being, goal four, education, goal five, gender. So it cuts across many, many genders and targets. The third reason it, is that it's the most prevalent form of violence against children, and it's particularly prevalent for young children, the, the most vulnerable and the smallest. So globally, we believe that around 1.3 billion children are subjected to violent punishment every year, and around two thirds of children aged two to four years old. So it's mo and it's most commonly used on youngest children. The fourth reason is that evidence from research is sending us a really very strong message now that corporal punishment carries multiple risks of harm and has no benefits. Um, so we have over 50 years of research, over 300 studies involving hundreds of thousands of children, and we have very clear links with um, direct and indirect physical harm, poor mental health, um, increased aggression in children, damage to education, uh, adult perpetration of violence and criminal behaviour later in life, closely associated with partner violence, and it's associated with other forms of violence in society. And we, we've just produced a new research summary which summarises all of this, and my colleague will be posting that in the chat. And then finally, corporal punishment has huge economic and other costs. So one study um, by UNICEF in 2015 found that in the East Asia Pacific region alone, the costs were around 39.6 billion US dollars a year, seen in the form of physical health care, mental health care, special educational needs, 
um, income support, social services, justice and other costs. So what's the main purpose of prohibiting all corporal punishment? So the main reason, the primary reason is to meet commitments to children's rights in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to meet our responsibility to protect children from violence. However, very significantly, the main practical purpose is education and prevention, sending a clear message that no level of violence in child rearing is acceptable or lawful. And this is about developing awareness and understanding and changing behavior. The main purpose of prohibition is not to punish parents and other caregivers. So laws banning corporal punishment should always be implemented with children's best interests at the forefront. So in other words, um, it's not in children's best interest for lots, for lots of parents to be put in prison or to be fined or to be severely punished. It's really in their best interest for families to be supported to adopt other nonviolent methods of child raising. And finally, there's no evidence of increased prosecutions of parents and carers where pro prohibition has been achieved. So what's the most effective strategy for eliminating corporal punishment? Is it education or law reform? And often the question is asked, why can't you just educate people away from corporal punishment? Why do you need to enact a law? It's controversial. Maybe people feel like it intrudes into people's lives. So Busman, Busman et al did a study focusing exactly on this question in 2011. And they looked at the various strategies of prohibition plus public education prohibition alone, public education alone, or neither. They looked at five countries in Europe. Some had prohibition and public education. One had prohibition alone, one had public education alone, and one had neither. And they asked a thousand parents in each country about whether they used corporal punishment. So the results were in that study that 9% in the countries which had prohibited and had public education campaigns reported using corporal punishment. Where there was prohibition alone, it was 14%, public education alone was 50%, and neither was 92%. So it was a really clear message that prohibition sends a very, very strong and clear message that violence in child raising is no longer acceptable and that the most effective strategy is a combination of law reform and public education. So as, as Irina mentioned, we've, we have made really good progress in the last 40 years. So 40 years ago, one country had prohibited all corporal punishment, that was Sweden. And now we've reached 63 states, the most recent being Colombia. If we think about the legality of corporal punishment of young children, we can think about the three settings where they are most likely to spend their time. It's home, daycare, and alternative care. So in, home, in the home setting, 63 countries have prohibited all corporal punishment in that setting, whereas 136 haven't. And then in daycare and alternative care, you can see that 70 countries in each of those have fully prohibited corporal punishment in those settings, whereas 129 haven't. And what we can see is that while we are making progress, there is still a significant amount of work to be done. It only represents 14% of children worldwide who are fully protected by law. So how is a law prohibiting corporal punishment put into practice? So we recently produced some implementation guidance and we outlined five key steps. The first one is to enact the law, which explicitly prohibits corporal punishment. The second is to plan and coordinate to develop a costed national action plan and integrate the new law into existing child protection systems. The third step is to communicate, to really invest in public education and um, awareness raising, and that once is probably not enough. This needs to be an ongoing commitment to, to communicate in in different ways, targeting different audiences. Step four is about supporting positive parenting. So parents, there's really a huge need for support for parenting and parents deserve support to move from violent ways of discipline to nonviolent approaches. 
And then finally, step five is about evaluation. So monitoring the impact of the interventions, seeing where the gaps are, seeing what needs to be done and reporting on progress. So what's the impact of, pro of prohibiting corporal punishment? So we, we, we need more evidence and research on the impact of prohibition, but what we have suggests that prohibition has a very significant impact. Um, and there's just a few examples of some countries here. We do have a lot more than this. So for example, Sweden enacted prohibition in 1979 and has regularly tracked the impact of that prohibition. So in the 1970s, around half of all children were smacked regularly. And in the year 2000, that was a few percent. And I believe it's just around one to two percent now. New Zealand, there was a large no, a majority for approved of corporal punishment in 1981. After the law was enacted in 2007, there was a significant drop so that there was a 40% approval of corporal punishment. And then five years after that, it had dropped further still to 19%. And then finally, Japan enacted prohibition in April 2020. And approval of corporal punishment was around 57% of adults in 2017, and that had dropped to 40% at the start of this year. So a 17% decrease was seen around the enactment of the law. And then we also see impacts on wider forms of violence. So in Sweden, along with drops in approval of corporal punishment, we also see declines in theft, narcotics crimes, assaults against young children, rape, and a decrease in suicide and use of alcohol and drugs by young people. In Finland, it's accompanied by a similar decline in the number of children who were murdered. And in Germany, there were linked decreases in violence by young people in school and elsewhere, and reductions in the proportion of women experiencing physical injury due to domestic violence. So I hope I have explained how enacting a law that bans corporal punishment and then putting that law into practice is a really effective strategy for addressing violence against children, including violence against very young children, and that the impacts are felt across society. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, do feel free to contact me. And Thanks so much, Bess. Um, thank you so much for providing that really great framework um, and overview of the global progress to date. Um, and so with that, we wanna dive into what the research tells us about the impact and prevalence of corporal punishment in the early years. So Jorge Cortes, who's also a Knowledge Fellow with ECTAN, over to you. Thank you, Sheikh Bufay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jorge Cuartas. I am a Knowledge Fellow at the Early Childhood Development Action Network, EGDAN, and also a PhD candidate at Harvard University. And today, what I hope to do is to provide a very brief overview on the recent research on corporal punishment, in particular on the prevalence of corporal punishment, its drivers, its developmental and health consequences, and also some, uh, some ideas on prevention strategies for corporal punishment in the early years of life. I want to focus on particular on the early years of life because early childhood is a sensitive period of development where early experiences, positive or negative, uh, determine different neural connections and determine or shape the brain architecture, uh, establishing solid or sturdy uh, basis upon which lifelong health and development will depend on. Uh, in these particular years, given the sensitivity of the brain and how responsive is the brain to experiences, violence, including corporal punishment, can have long lasting consequences on biological, health, educational uh, outcomes, given the potential effects on brain development, on biological systems, and also on the develop uh, development of early social, emotional, and cognitive skills. In the early years of life, uh, one of the most uh, common forms of violence, or in particular, the most common form of violence against children is corporal punishment. And what we know, according to uh, recent research, is that about two out of three children, younger than five, experience spanking, hitting with objects and other forms of corporal punishment uh, in their homes, according to data that was collected uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. The prevalence of corporal punishment has been estimated to lay between 40% in East Europe um, and Central Asia, 
up to more than 70% in sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Middle East and North Africa. What we know uh, from current evidence, growing evidence, is that this prevalence has gone up amid the COVID uh, pandemic. So to give you an example, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, we have several different studies that have used uh, surveys and also administrative data showing very important increments in the use of corporal punishment and other forms of violence against children, which is something that also resonates and aligns with uh, global trends and what we are seeing from reviews of the literature showing very important increments in violence against children and domestic violence more broadly uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Considering the prevalence and the recent increments in violence against children, uh, one question that may arise is why parents and other caregivers use corporal punishment against children. And what the evidence shows is that parents, educators, and other caregivers generally want the best for children, but may not have access to information, the resources, or the capabilities to offering a nurturing care and to use positive uh, discipline techniques. In particular, if we consider a social ecological perspective, such as the one proposed by the WHO Inspire framework, we can think about uh, risk and protection factors as very important drivers or determinants of children's protection or risk of experiencing corporal punishment. For example, when we think about different child characteristics such as age, uh, sex, gender, or disabilities, for example, the research shows us that some of these characteristics may place certain children at higher risk of experiencing corporal punishment. At the family and household level, we also know that some risk factors may include uh, caregivers with mental health challenges, or who experience adversities in their own childhood, for example, who were exposed to corporal punishment in this process of intergenerational transmission of corporal punishment, uh, or also having unrealistic expectations about what children can do in different developmental uh, periods. Then we also know that some risk factors could be uh, placed in the community and society level, including social and legal normalization of violence, and also gender inequity. At the same time, we have also identified in research some factors that may increase children's protection from corporal punishment and other forms of violence, including uh, shared parenting load within households, also confidence in parenting skills and adequate attitudes and beliefs about what is adequate in different developmental stages and also knowledge on child rearing and child development uh, in general, as well as having strong communities, effective social programs and social, economic and gender equity uh, in communities and in countries in general. Regarding the consequences of corporal punishment, which is something that has uh, gained a lot of uh, momentum and attention in the past uh, few years, given the growing amount of evidence from multiple countries and settings, what we have found is that corporal punishment can lead to several negative consequences on skill development and even on brain development. Actually, a recent study that we conducted uh, comparing children who were spanked and not spanked in the first years of life, we found that children who were spanked early in life exhibited a typical neural activation in areas of the prefrontal cortex, in particular in the areas that you can see in yellow and red in the uh, figure in this slide, uh, relative to children who were not spanked. And this is concerning considering that these areas in the prefrontal cortex play a central, a critical role in high order cognition, including executive function and also in social emotional skills like emotion regulation and conflict solving skills. Uh, other research that have used uh, causal designs in order to establish the causal effect of corporal punishment on children's development have found consistent results uh, showing impacts on social emotional and cognitive development. For example, a study of a national sample of Bhutanese young children found that spanking, and spanking in particular, and other forms of corporal punishment that may be more severe, but only spanking, which is highly normative uh, in several countries around the world, uh, impairs social emotional development, in particular emotion regulation and conflict solving skills, which is consistent with findings from this other neuroimaging study I just uh, told you about. Another study in Colombia found that infants who were spanked very early in life show a slower cognitive growth by ages 27 to 46 months, uh, which is something that could uh, increase as children grew older, but we only had data for this particular period uh, in time. And more recently, another study in the US of identical twin pairs found that the twin who experienced corporal punishment 
uh, punishment develop more antisocial behaviors in time, showing in this way that corporal punishment is ineffective in improving behavior, as is intended by some parents with its use, and actually can lead to the opposite uh, consequences, increasing children's dysregulation or emotion regulation problems, and also increasing antisocial uh, and other negative uh, behaviors. Other research has complemented this uh, very specific research in, in a specific countries by using uh, cross uh, country and cross cultural samples, mostly from UNICEF's multiple indicators cluster survey. This research has covered several countries, such as the one showed in this uh, figure. And what the research shows is that corporal punishment in general can be detrimental for children, in particular, children who experience corporal punishment are about 24 percent le less likely to be developmentally on track, to be on track on their development, according to an indicator that is used by, by the Sustainable Development Goals. This research is also interesting in that it shows that in no single country, corporal punishment has positive associations with any positive developmental outcome. On the opposite, in every single country, including these studies, corporal punishment has been shown to lead to potential negative consequences on children's uh, health, development, and well-being. Considering the prevalence, the drivers, and the potential developmental consequences of corporal punishment, it is very important to work on prevention strategies to prevent not only corporal punishment, but also all forms of violence against children uh, early in life. And one of the most promising approaches to do so is parenting uh, programs. In particular, we have several uh, experimental studies, randomized control trials, showing that parenting programs can lead to reductions in violence against children and also contribute to a healthy development of skills early in life. To give you a couple of examples, we have experimental evidence for programs like Parenting for Lifelong Health in Thailand and South Africa. Also, parents make the difference in Liberia. Also, uh, programs in Colombia, the Ari Homes Toolbox in Jamaica, uh, and other programs in Rwanda and uh, other settings. All these programs showing uh, very important, very promising uh, positive effects on reducing corporal punishment and other harsh punishments and violence against children, and also in supporting positive parenting practices and supporting children's behavior and social emotional development. When we analyze all these programs all together, it is possible to see that they have common components, common content that may explain their effectiveness and that could also inform future uh, intervention efforts. In particular, most of, the, of these programs place a lot of emphasis on helping caregivers, parents and educators understand children's development behaviors and needs in different developmental stages. Also provide a lot of support on emotion management techniques, both for adults and also for children. Also place a lot of emphasis on the importance of the mental health and well-being of parents and caregivers. Also on teaching uh, and training parents on positive discipline methods and behavior management techniques. Finally, on promoting uh, positive parenting and stimulation practices, and also on engaging fathers, uh, men, and other uh, also household members in child rearing in general. And something that it's also very important to mention is that these programs are highly flexible and can be implemented that actually have been implemented using multiple platforms, including home visits, community meetings, also through healthcare facilities, and more recently in the COVID pandemic with a lot of innovations also using these programs uh, with online platforms and even uh, through telephone uh, calls in Latin America, for example. Besides parenting programs, considering the drivers of corporal punishment and how important it is to consider an ecological perspective when working on violence prevention, it's important that we also work in other prevention strategies, including uh, national strategies to prevent violence, also strengthening national, regional, and local coordination and intersector coordination, also working on communication uh, and promoting changes in social norms around violence, such as mass education campaigns, integrating messages of violence prevention in different sectors, also working with professionals that interact with families, such as pediatricians and educators, as well as community indigenous, religious and political leaders who may be highly influential on parenting decisions. Uh, similarly, as Beth was just mentioning, it's important to continue the progress on uh, prohibiting corporal punishment and all other forms of violence against children uh, all around the world. 
and also working on supporting caregivers, educators, uh, and parents, such as with income and economic supports, parenting programs, family-friendly policies, including paid maternity and paternity leaves, as well as affordable childcare, and also providing extensive mental health care uh, supports for families. And finally, it's also important to continue working on local research and on strengthening monitoring and evaluation systems in order to inform policy and practice in an effective way. Uh, to conclude, we have seen that corporal punishment is widespread around the world and also that multiple risk and protective factors may drive its incidence, which uh, collectively informs the importance of prevention and promotion when working on the issue of corporal punishment and not only uh, focusing on reacting to actual cases of violence against children. Second, not a single study has found that corporal punishment might be beneficial for any child developmental or health outcome. In contrast, all the research shows that corporal punishment can undermine different uh, early skills as well as brain development leading to potential long lasting uh, consequences. Given this, it's important to work on parenting programs and also on our supports for parents, massive education campaigns, legislation, as well as on research and evaluation to prevent violence against uh, children. If you are interested in learning more about some of this research, you can scan this QR code that you can see on the screen. We are also gonna share a link in a second for you to be able to download uh, the briefing that we are launching today on ending corporal punishment in the early years of uh, childhood. With that, I want to conclude. Uh, here you can find my contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any question. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Jorge, for that whirlwind tour of where the research stands on corporal punishment. Um, I just want to take a quick pause to see if anybody has any questions for Bess and Jorge about what we heard so far. Um, before we begin to dive into the country examples. So if you do, you can raise your hand or pop your question in the chat. Um, and if not, we'll keep uh, moving along. So this is your chance. Okay. Um, I want to encourage you to ask your questions as you're listening to the presentations. If I can request the presenters to go a bit slowly because you are sharing a lot of information and so just to give people time to digest. All right, we're really excited now to go into country examples. We're be, we'll be hearing um, from uh, the, the, the situation in Jamaica and then Nepal. So to kick us off, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Helen Baker Henningham from Bangor University and University of the West Indies, who will provide us with an example of nonviolent parenting program in Jamaica and lessons learned from development, implementation and research. So over to you, Helen. Hi everybody, and thank you so much for um, attending this. It's really exciting. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the Ivory Toolbox programs, which we're implementing in Jamaica. And although they've been implemented for Jamaica, we believe they have um, lots of, they can be adapted for other environments. So if you are interested in the toolbox, please do reach out. It's available under a Creative Commons license, so you're allowed to take it and adapt it to your own context. Um, so the IRA Toolbox programs are integrated violence prevention and early childhood development programs, and they're implemented across both home and school settings in Jamaica. The primary aims of the program are twofold, to prevent caregivers' use of violence against children, and also to prevent the early development of antisocial behaviour in young children. And the reason why we target both of these um, as primary aims is because the um, common core components of interventions to prevent child maltreatment are very similar to the common core components of interventions to prevent child conduct problems. So these interventions can very easily be um, conducted simultaneously. Of course, we're not only trying to prevent um, negative outcomes, we're also trying to promote positive outcomes. So the programs aim to increase caregivers' positive parenting practices and also parent well-being, importantly, caregivers' well-being, and to increase children's development across multiple domains, including their social emotional skills, self-regulation skills, and school readiness. And we've developed two programs. The IRI Classroom Toolbox is a teacher training program, and the IRI Homes Toolbox is a parenting program. 
and both programs have been developed from theory. So we've identified the common core components of effective interventions to prevent child maltreatment and to prevent child conduct problems. And we've, we've also identified evidence-based behavior change techniques, and these are the core of the program. And then we've operationalized these to make them easy to use in early childhood educational settings with both parents and teachers. And um, the aim is for them to be acceptable, feasible, relevant, and effective. And in addition, we want them to be low cost. We want them to be integrated into the existing system and aligned with the aims of the system to be delivered by existing staff so that we don't need an extra tier of um, manpower. And from the outset, from the very beginning of the design in the study, we work in partnership with the end users, including parents, teachers, and with um, especially frontline government staff, in addition to um, higher level government staff. All the programmes are rigorously evaluated and we, as we evaluate, we make revisions based on the results of the evaluations to make the programmes more efficient as we um, learn more about how they are being implemented. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Ivy Classroom Toolbox. So the Ivy Classroom Toolbox is our teacher training programme. And we use this um, metaphor of a toolbox because the strategies that are taught are tools that parents and teachers can use with their children at home and at school. And the, for the Ivy Classroom Toolbox, these tools are put together into four modules. We have a module on how to create an emotionally supportive classroom environment, a module on how to manage children's behaviour, and this includes being proactive to prevent behaviour problems, and also how to manage misbehaviour when it does occur. We have a module on how to promote children's social emotional competence, and a module on behaviour planning, and this incorporates both individual behaviour planning for children who might need more support, and class-wide behaviour planning if teachers identify a class-wide issue that they need to tackle. We have um, resources for teachers, and these are available on our website, iritoolbox.com, and these include manuals for teachers, um, activity book, which is like homework assignments, teachers have little activities they can do in the classroom and record their progress, and we also have materials that teachers can use with children. For example, we have 14 social problem, social problem solving stories, which are pictorial stories representing common problems children face in school. Um, we have these cards to teach emotions, to teach friendship skills and to teach rules. Um, the toolbox is delivered through a series of training workshops and in class or in school support. So we've developed um, 20 training sessions lasting approximately 90 minutes. So it's about five days of training, or if people don't have full five days available, you know, depending on the um, government training schedules, they could be delivered in half days or in after school sessions. But the training workshops introduce the teachers to the content, and then the in-class support provides teachers with some support in the classroom to help them to implement the strategies in their own context. Teachers also receive um, these classroom assignments. And one of the key goals of the classroom assignments is really to encourage the teachers to use the strategies and then to identify how it's helping the children and how it's helping them. Because when they see those benefits, they're more likely to continue using it. Again, we have resources, including um, a fully scripted training manual, a guide for providing in-class support, a guide for providing support at the school level, and um, video vignettes to use for training. This programme has been evaluated in two cluster randomised trials in Jamaica, one in preschool and one in primary school, and we found very large reductions to teachers' use of violence against children, and these reductions were sustained over time. We found benefits to teachers, not only in terms of improved skills, but also in terms of improved professional well-being and increased retention. We found benefits to the quality of the classroom environment and benefits to children across multiple domains. And this program is currently being integrated into the existing teacher training initiatives um, in Jamaica through the government network. And the second program I'm going to talk about is the Irie Homes Toolbox. And this is a complementary parenting intervention. So it complements the Irie Classroom Toolbox. And the aim is for this program to be implemented by preschool teachers 
who've been trained in the IRA classroom toolbox. And it was designed to be an eight week program um, so that it fits into one school term. So we want it to be feasible for teachers to deliver. And it's held with small groups of parents on the school compound. And the content of this program is shown in our IRA tower. And we use the IRA tower during the parenting sessions to help parents to understand how to use the content. So you'll see on the base of the tower, we have our green blocks. And these are the blocks that aim to promote children's positive behavior and to promote that very strong relationship between parents and children. And this is where we want parents to be spending most of their time with their children. The yellow blocks are um, strategies to prevent pro behavior problems. So for example, providing clear instructions, knowing your child, teaching children little skills and household rules they need, and giving children um, some autonomy through independence and choice. Also included in the yellow blocks is understanding your child's behavior. You know, we as parents may see a behavior as being a misbehavior, but actually it's just children being children, children exploring their environment, having fun, copying us, trying to be independent. And we perceive that as misbehavior. And so we try to, you know, we try to do that with the parents to help them to realize it's not misbehavior, it's just children being children. Um, up here we have our orange and red blocks. A very important block is the managing emotions. This is about emotional self-regulation, helping parents to take a pause. When you feel yourself getting angry, take a pause, stop and think, understand why your child is behaving that way and choose an appropriate block from the IRA tower to help you. If parents find they need to use these orange and red blocks, which are strategies to manage misbehavior, they need to use them very sparingly. And as soon as they've used them, they need to come right back down to the green blocks. So this provides a nice little um, structure for parents to understand the program. What isn't represented on the Ivy Tower are some key skills we also include, which is um, encouraging parents to praise themselves and acknowledging the good things they do and also encouraging parents to take some time for themselves. We call it me time. So we have IRA time, which is the time when parents spend with their children doing um, child-led play. And we have me time, which is the time parents spend <laughs> doing things that they want to do just for them. May I interrupt you? Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat. It seems like you're referring to a presentation, but there's no presentation showing. We just wanna make sure we're not missing a presentation. You're not seeing my screen? We haven't been seeing any slides, so we didn't know whether you, you were presenting without, and I'm oh. noticing quite a few slides. Um, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, that's uh, okay. Shall I? Can you see yeah. it now? We can see your screen now, and we do have a oh. bit of extra time. Um, and oh, we really I'm so, so different... sorry. I'm so, that's so okay. sorry. That's okay, Helen. So I want to invite you maybe... Um, uh, maybe not go through the slides in details, but at least the ones that are visually very relevant, if you could kind of yeah. touch, touch back on them, that would be really helpful. Thank you. All right. Sorry. So I do apologize for that. I thought my screen was shared. <laughs> um, so just to zip back, this is our toolbox. So I told you it's it's a toolbox. So we um, have these strategies. Helen, I'm so sorry to again interrupt you, but would you mind um, sharing it in and not in presenter mode so that we don't because we the the slides are quite small for us. Um, so if you just yeah share them without the presenter notes and things, then that would be great. Can you see it like this? Uh, sure. Maybe we can make it bigger. Um, wow. So sorry. Is that better? Um, yeah, much better. Thank you. I don't know why it's so why that happened. Um, okay, well, I'm really, really sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. This is the resources from the program from the Ivy Classroom Toolbox here, and the teacher resources. Um, this this presentation will be available. We can make it available, right? I could post post it and I could send it to you so people can see it. Um, these are the intervention materials for facilitators. Um, and then this is, oh, this is where I was up to the IRA tower. So the green blocks, the yellow blocks, the orange blocks, and the red blocks. Um, so that is the IRA tower that I was talking about earlier, which helps parents to understand the program. Um, here are the intervention resources for facilitators that we use in the IRA Homes toolbox. So there is a facilitator manual a series of um, picture cards used to prompt discussion. 
some handheld cards that are used to reinforce key points in the program. So these are the intervention resources for the facilitators. And we also have intervention resources for parents. So each session, parents receive a take home card that summarizes the session. They receive a little um, sheet to record their homework or their um, home activity. And there's this oath, which at the end of the session, the parents sign to commit to being an IRI parent and commit to doing these different strategies. And all of these resources will be available on our website, hopefully um, early in the new year, or certainly in the first half of 2022. So you'd be very happy you know, to go on and take a look and see if there's anything that would be helpful for you. Um, this program has also been evaluated in a small cluster randomized trial in Jamaican preschools. And we found reductions to parents' use of violence, increases in parents' involvement with their child and reductions in child behavior difficulties for children with um, at risk for continued conduct problems. Um, we're currently, or we have currently adapted the IRI Homes Toolbox for virtual delivery, and we're evaluating it in a randomized trial. And for this program, we, the program has been extended to 10 to 12 week intervention. And the intervention consists of virtual groups, which are conducted by government officers from the Early Childhood Commission. And at the end of the group, the summary notes are sent via WhatsApp. So that's the equivalent of the take home card. Parents receive three SMS per week. And in addition, they have um, access to a data free app. And on the app, new material is uploaded every week, including videos, an IRI challenge, which is their um, assignment for the week, and an IRI tower, which is a pictorial representation of the content covered that week. Um, and here is an example of how we've used our videos. So we've made videos to represent our IRI tower. So each week there's a video which gives the um, a video of parents and children at home using the strategies that were covered in that session. And as this is a integrated violence prevention and child development program, we also have um, additional videos focusing on, you know, how to engage in play with your child, including playing inside, playing outside, playing pretend, how to look at books and how to help your child with homework. And each of these videos is between about four to eight minutes long. Um, we have a selection of um, academic articles on this, if anyone is interested. And um, thank you so much. And I do apologize profusely for um, the problems with the slides, but I'm very happy to send them to um, Bess and she could make them available um, if necessary. Yeah, we'll make all the slides available to everybody that comes to the webinar. We'll send them all out. Thanks so much. So big apologies for that mess up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar without at least one night, Helen. So thank you for uh, being a good sport. Um, very well. And now from Jamaica, we're going to head to Nepal and we'll hear from Lalpura Shahi from Save the Children in Nepal. Um, Lalpura, please share with us what your experience of nonviolent parenting in um, Nepal is all about. Sorry, hi, Sekufe. Uh, Lalpura will be presenting in Nepali, so I'll be doing the translation in uh, English. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. It's evening in Nepal, so uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let me show you the slide. Namaste. I'm Lalpura but okay, can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. This is uh can you, Limba, can you do it in slide share mode, please? Oh sorry. Yeah. Is that okay? Perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, this is Limba Rai from uh, Save the Children uh, Nepal office and with me today I have Lalpura Sahi from Kalikot and Dil Ar Sar from uh, Save the Children. Uh, today we are going to share our experiences, our attempts and practices, what we have been doing here in Nepal on uh, 
parenting without violence session on uh, reducing or uh, eliminating the violence against uh, children. So Lalpura Sahi is one of the uh, parenting without sessions uh, facilitators. She is working as a volunteer for Save the Children, and she has been doing a lot of work in parenting without violence session in our um, working area. So uh, I think she will start the presentation now. Uh, start with the answer, Lalpura. Yes, madam. शारीरिक तथा मानसिक सजाय अन्त्य गर्ने सम्बन्धमा हाम्रो अनुभव कस्तो रह्यो त भन्ने बारेमा हामी आज सम्बोधन गर्ने छौं ओके टुडे वी आर गोइंग टु शेयर आवर एक्सपीरियन्सेस अन एन्डिंग अल काइंड्स अफ अब्युज एन्ड फिजिकल एन्ड ह्युमिलिटिङ पनिशमेन्ट अगेन्स्ट चिल्ड्रन हाम्रो यस्तो भौगोलिक बनावटमा हामीले क्रियाकलाप सञ्चालन गरेका छौं भौगोलिक बनावट हाम्रो यस्तो छ भूगोल Okay, so one of our working areas of our project is Kalikot. You can see in the picture here, it's a very remote hilly area uh, in uh, Kalikot. It is uh, Suba Kalika Rural Municipality, Ward number six, where we are conducting our parenting without violence session. I'm going to ask you to ask the Bishri Vastu Arishwami Tegasam. Sayatra Pari Janaka Jankari, Karikaram Santavan Sutra Vavastha, Balwali Gamati Uni Ingsha, Ante Amru, Prasta Thao Bias, कोविड नाइन्टीन को अवस्था में कार्यक्रम संचालन को तैयारी कार्यक्रम सहभागी संख्या कार्यक्रम संचालन भोग चुनौती और समस्या सीकाईर के बारे में ओके सो I'm so sorry that we are sharing our presentation in Nepali but I will also be providing the English version of this presentation to uh, Bess uh, so today the contents of our presentation are uh, the a short brief of, of our project Sahayatra 2 and um, the our working areas and what are what are we doing our attempts and practices on ending the violence against children and what we did during COVID-19 pandemic situation uh, similarly the total reach how many we have reached how many, how many participants and children we have been able to reach and uh, at last we'll be also sharing our challenges and learning section you Sahayatra Pariyajana Kutsutu Jankari समुदाय एवं जोखिम अवस्था में रहकर बाल बालिका गुणस्तरी सीकाई संक्षिप्त रसूर सुरक्षित रहने आदि यार सुनिश्चित कर रहा सरकार से हम मिले रहा काम करते सा ये पारी जना है इसे रहता भी बात को साधा बता रहा लाग करते आएगे सो सॉरी so our project Sahatra 2 is being funded by NORAD and it is being implemented in five of the rural municipalities and uh, municipalities of Karnali province here in Nepal. Uh, it has been initiated since 2019 and it is a five-year project. So it will be uh, it will be going on till 2023. And uh, we work for three of the major thematic areas, education, uh, child rights and child rights governments. And we also work in close coordination and collaboration with the local governments to uh, address the issues of marginalized and backward uh, communities and children. And uh, under this program, we have been conducting parenting without violence common approach since 2000 and 2019. <laughs> भारत में काम को जाने महिला बाल बालिका शारीरिक मानसिक सामाजिक 
सामान्य रूप में लिने गई पाइज र बेस्टलाइन सर्वे अध्ययन कर सजा दि पर्च भतिशत पचपन्न पॉइंट अड़सठी प्रतिशत रहे This project has been working in five rural municipalities of Karnali province where uh, you saw that we also work in one of the most remote uh, areas of Kalikot, uh, Subakalika rural municipality. Uh, the municipality is uh, lags very behind in uh, education, health sector and human development index uh, in municipal level, according to the municipal level data. And similarly, there are various kinds of harmful, harmful practices like uh, early child marriage and uh, children abuse, child labor and chaupadi, we call it here in Nepal, chaupadi, where they have to stay in a, in a, in a small shed during their menstru menstruation period. Uh, these such kind of uh, malpractices are being practiced in uh, Karnali province. And similarly, because of uh, poverty, majority of the uh, male parents, they go to India to earn money and um, uh, ladies or women are involved in uh, household chores and agricultural works. We carried out a baseline uh, assessment or baseline evaluation in 2019, where we found out that 55.68% of the uh, parents believe that giving punishment to the children or uh, punishing them, physical and humiliating uh, punishment giving to them is an acceptable behavior. It was 55.68 percentage. Balvalika, Arumati, Uni, Inksante, Amru, Prashtatha, Abhyas, Aru, Bivinna, Umiya, Kaap, Aviyava, Garuko, Tinota, Samoa, Panayaka, Inksha, Raik, Aviyak, Naugata, Station, Satra, Aru, Salai, Kutu, Vane, Dosta, Balvalika, Lai, Kutu, Lai, Kutu, औपचारिक Uh, uh, there were three groups of children aged from six to nine, uh, 10 to 12, and uh, 13 to 16. Uh, nine of the positive parenting sessions were carried out for the parents, whereas uh, children were children participated on 10 sessions. Uh, except these, we also uh, except these sessions, we also conducted some other informal sessions with the um, mothers group in schools and uh, in peer groups also. बालबालिका Okay. In addition to these sessions, we also conducted um, uh, history drama, similarly community dialogues and inter uh, interaction programs in the community with the help of the child clubs. We also did some sessions in schools where we um, uh, sensitized them about abuse against uh, children and violence against children. Uh, similarly, in child club meetings also, we participated and uh, did discussion on the learning achievements of the um, classes. And we also conducted some home visit sessions for the uh, parents and guardians, targeting uh, parents and guardians, where we discussed about uh, child lobbies and child rights issues. COVID-19 ko avastha karyakram sanchalan ko tarika. COVID-19 ko avastha mar sabko kadi kya? Samet India baato tool sankhya ma kamdar aru bar par ki da school aru bandha hoyega. Tere gaon ma karyakram maru pani sanchalan karna sanchalan ki bichhe na gaon. Okay. During COVID-19, uh, with the increasing number of cases in COVID-19, we had to go to a different adapted modality for conducting the parenting without violence session, as there were a lot of no lot number of people uh, incoming from India uh, who were uh, there for uh, labor work or um, 
other income generating work. Uh, there was a lot of people coming from India. So uh, people were a little bit, uh, there was chaos and there was a little stressful environment. So uh, uh, which affected uh, most of the children in our communities, in our working areas. There was lockdown and schools were totally closed and uh, every kind of uh, interaction programs and discussion programs, our sessions were totally stopped. So what we did was we went through a little bit of different uh, adapted modality where we went to uh, conduct home visits for parents and similarly for the children who were going through a, a difficult phase of their life, we uh, gave them information on psychosocial counselors and we also provided them with the contact numbers or numbers of those psychosocial counselors so, so that they could uh, vent out some of their stresses uh, through uh, them. COVID-19 was a Okay, to conduct this uh, parenting without uh, violence session, we also conducted a radio program. We prepared a radio uh, audio dialogue program where uh, these uh, parenting sessions and positive parenting sessions were uh, broadcasted through radio and we uh, uh, convert messages to the uh, community people that it was going to be aired through radio uh, radio program at a certain time so we uh, suggested them or we uh, convert message to them to listen to those radio programs on uh, uh, positive parenting sessions it was called kalila muna in nepali uh, similarly we also initiated a uh, role model parent uh, concept where uh, role models of uh, our neighboring communities were mobilized to uh, you know influence other parents also to do to follow the similar uh, um, good practices and similarly we also um, um, uh, we also developed uh, the sorry the parents and children also uh, they combinedly developed the code of conduct and prepared developed uh, daily routine. Uh, with the encouragement from our uh, um, staffs. Karikaram la Karikaram battle paya ko jamma samkhya balwali ka tin se sataish rakho sabani abhi bhai bishe bish rakho cha. From this uh, parenting without violence session, we were able to reach three hundred twenty seven of the children and two hundred twenty uh, two hundred twenty of the adults were. Uh, girls were 182 and boys were, one, were 145 and 48 of the male parents uh, participated in the session along with 172 female members. Um, like I said earlier, when we carried out the baseline assessment in 2019, uh, the number of uh, the percentage of parents who accepted uh, parenting, uh, physical and humiliating punishment is an acceptable behavior was 55.68%. Uh, recently, we did a midterm evaluation in 2021. The uh, percentage was 22.81. So this was the decrease in the percentage by 32.87%. And similarly, we have, uh, sorry. Um, similarly, these are the some of the quotes from the communities where, um, uh, one of the chairperson of war number six said that the program was very very uh, useful and he would uh, he had uh, been doing the field visits and he saw that there was change in the community and he would like to support our campaign to uh, you know uh, decrease child marriages and violence against children cases uh, there were other also parents like Monkaula and Dharma who said that, uh, you know, scolding and beating was an uh, acceptable uh, tradition uh, to discipline the children, to discipline their um, children to the right path. And they were also uh, sensitized that giving names to their children, giving nicknames to their children was a very wrong thing to do. Uh, and now they have, uh, this session has, be, uh, has been like an uh, eye opener for these uh, parents. Covid-19 
But during COVID-19 also, we conducted micing programs where we um, conveyed information on when we are going to conduct the radio programs on parenting without violence. Similarly, we also used to give them uh, information messages on uh, child rights and child rights issues, uh, impact of uh, violence against children in their mental health and development. कार्यक्रम संचालन गर्दा भोगेका चुनौतीहरु कोभिड-19 को अवस्थामा भारतमा ठूलो संख्यामा घर फर्किदा गाउँको गाउँमा तराशको वातावरण सृजना हुनु अभिभावक जम्मा गरी कक्षा संचालन गर्न नसक्नु लकडाउनमा विद्यालय बन्द हुँदा बाल हिंसा र बाल विवाह घटनाहरु बढ्नु अभिभावकको आय स्रोत कम हुँदा बालबालिकाहरुको पोषण र घरमा उचित स्याहार नहुनु मनोसामाजिक समस्या देखिनु शुभकालिका these are some of the challenges which we faced during uh, conduction of this parenting without violence session uh, during COVID-19 as there were a lot of people returning from India there was a, a stressful environment a chaotic environment uh, in our community where uh, we could not conduct uh, sessions for the for both the parents and the children and because of the lockdown, all the schools were closed. So there were rising number of cases in uh, children abuse and child right, uh, sorry, child marriage cases. And similarly, uh, as parents were not able to uh, um, do the income generation activities, children had to suffer from uh, malnutrition and they were not given uh, care and uh, attention. Uh, similarly, some of the children were also seen having uh, psychosocial problems and because of uh, the telephone and internet uh, uh, accessibility, they, they, sorry, there is no uh, easy accessibility of telephone and internet in Suva Kalika, which, um, which is a major challenge for conducting parenting without violence session. आवश्यक सूचना पत्रा सहयोग तो रहेछ बा लिङ्चान्ते गर्न अभिभावक पक्षमा अब अथवा गाउँ गाउँमा छलफल बैठक सडक नाटक जस्ता अभिभावक सन्देश दिएमा सहयोग पुग्दो रहेछ मनोसामाजिक समस्या बारे जानकारी र आवश्यक सहयोग बारे अभिभावकले सूचना दिनु अति आवश्यक रहेछ लकडाउन मा माइक दिने माइक बारे दिने सूचनाहरु गाउँमा बा लिङ्चा रोक्न सहयोग पुग्दो रहेछ Limba, I'm. Um, I hope you're wrapping up soon because I think we're now very over yeah. time. Thank you. Okay, so so sorry. This is the last slide. Uh, okay. Uh, these are some of the learnings which we um we were able to um understand while we were conducting our program. Uh, not only the uh, parenting without violence sessions, not only focusing to the sessions, we also need to uh, think of a different way or think out of the box. So we had mobilized role model parents. Similarly, we did uh, um, community programs uh, also and street dramas. We also took help from the uh, child clubs. Similarly, we ran out uh, other campaigns like uh, um, giving messages on child uh, child marriage cases is what are the impacts of child uh, early child marriages similarly we also need to address psychosocial uh, problems uh, for both the children and also their parents and uh, conducting micing programs during the lockdown seems like a very effective idea um, of running the uh, sessions during covid-19 pandemic situation um I think this is the uh, last uh, slide. Thank you slide. I would like to thank everyone for their uh, time. And I'm so sorry Sekufe, for taking so long. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you Bess for giving us uh, No time. problem. So Limba, would you mind taking down the slides? Sure, sure. Um, wonderful. So we can ju just jump right in. We have about five, seven minutes. Um, so I'm just going to invite some of our participants to uh, share their questions live. So May Aung, if you can unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question to our panelists, that would be great. May, let us know where you're uh, calling in from. Yes, I'm May. I'm from Myanmar. I'm currently studying uh, study in VN VNN. Uh, my question is uh, how to combat and pass the population Yeah, uh, to participate in my research interviews and savvy. So uh, that our community, I think that uh, like a corporate punishment at home 
is a sensitive issue. So how can I solve uh, and how can I find a possible solution for this uh, situation? Thank you. Thank you so much, May. Would anyone like to just jump in and uh, take that question? Helen, Jorge, Beth, um, Lalpura. I'm afraid I didn't completely understand the question. Did you get it, Shikufe? May, are you able to repeat your question? Uh, yes. Uh, my question is how to uh, contact and pass the population to participate uh, in the research survey and interview. So if the topic seems to be culturally sensitive for them. Because of I'm, uh, I'm conducting my master thesis uh, in the uh, topic of corporal punishment at homes. So uh, in Myanmar, there's very, uh, there, this, this sensitive issue is why. Thank you. I, have one I need a lot of your- to make on yeah. that, if that's okay. Yes. Um, I think parents' motivation to do the best for their children is really, really strong. And when you try to communicate in that way, to, 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 in particular to talk about the evidence from research and the evidence on cognitive development and on how well children will do at school and in their, their later life, I think that's a really powerful approach. Um, and that's been very effective in other places. For example, in Japan, most people who changed their opinion about corporal punishment said it was after learning about the, the evidence of the harm of corporal punishment. They learned that it wasn't a harmless practice, that it actually had a lot of harm associated with it. So that's one thing I would say. Thanks, Bess. Jorge, Helen, do you want to chime in? Um, in terms of in intervention, one... oh, sorry. go ahead, Jorge. Okay, just, just wanted to add very quickly one thing, and is that I also think that there are some uh, guidelines and manuals on how to conduct research on corporal punishment and how to engage uh, participants in this type of research. I think there's one in particular by Save the Children that you can find uh, online with some suggestions on how to recruit participants and also how to conduct uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, research. So that uh, could be useful as well. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move. Helen, did you want to add something more? Go ahead. I was just going to say for intervention research, we usually focus on the benefits to parents and children. So rather than saying, you know, we want you to stop doing something, we focus on, you know, what you can do differently. And we find that's a much better approach to come at it from um, how can you help your child, similar to what Bess was saying, how can you support your child, how it will help you and how it will help your child now and in the future. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Samia Kassid. If you can unmute yourself, let us know where you're calling in from and ask your question. Yes, hi, good afternoon. And thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, I'm, I'm calling actually from Hamburg. I'm from the World Future Council and we, are, we highlight good policies. And in 2015, we awarded Sweden with, with a special award because of their really uh, breaking uh, policy. And Beth, you have already um, describe some of this um, things, but my question is, how can, what can we do to reach out to religious uh, parents, because usually they believe they have the right to, um, to punish their children, because this is, let's say, part of the Bible, or part of, you know, of the Quran, or whatever, and I think this is also a really big challenge, um, beyond positive parenting, and it would be really interesting to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samia. Who'd I like to respond? I can respond a little bit to that. Um, so there has been quite a bit of work done on religious um, obstacles to eliminating corporal punishment. Um, if you in particular look at the work of Aragatu and the World, World Council of Churches, they've made some really strong statements about um, the principles of nonviolence and love and peace that kind of that cut across all religions. And there are really interesting interpretations of religions from each religion 
um, can be interpreted as being nonviolent and supporting nonviolent parenting. So there's, so I think the case is that there's nothing inherent about any religion or its teachings that endorses violent punishment of children. So in particular, in relation to the, the spare the rod, um, what is it, spare the rod and spoil the child, I think there's lots of scholars that argue that that's more about the importance of guiding a child rather than necessarily about violence. Um, but there are lots of resources around this and I will share them in the chat. Thank you, Bess. Um, Jorge, Helen, do you wanna chime in on that question? And I think we have time for one last question. Um, Sally, would you like to unmute, let us know where you're calling in from and ask your question? Hi, um, calling from the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Um, thank you for the presentations, super interesting session. I just had a question on um, research and was wondering if there's any specific uh, research that you know about that uh, makes a direct link between violence against children, in particular violent punishment, and out of school children. Over. Uh, I think I think that there's uh, a lot of research on the potential educational consequence of corporal punishment. I'm not aware if there's something specific about that. But I guess that, uh, yeah, a good, a, a good approach to answer this question could also be to go to the existing meta-analysis on corporal punishment. I think there's uh, pretty strong evidence uh, on the potential consequences on educational achievement in particular, uh, but not that much maybe in that regard, but uh, I would have to, to double check. I guess that in any case, it's also difficult to establish those links because uh, there could be other factors explaining both these educational decisions and also the use of corporal punishment. So it's difficult to establish the causal link between corporal punishment and, and, and that specific uh, outcome. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess in those meta-analyses, in particular the work of Professor Elizabeth Kershaw, uh, there could be some areas uh, around that. Um, just to say in our IRI toolbox research, we have actually found increased attendance. So in the schools where teachers have been trained in the IRI toolbox, which is encouraging teachers to use nonviolent um, disciplinary methods and to provide a more exciting, emotionally supportive um, classroom environment, children attend more. Um, so although not directly related to out of school children, it does increase school attendance, which we found very surprising at this young age, because we didn't think children had such a, a big input into whether they went to school or not. But obviously, um, there is some link there. Brilliant. Um, and with that, um, it's, I want to just thank all the panelists for your excellent presentations and insights on this issue. And I'd like to invite the two leaders of our um, partnerships that are co-hosting this, uh, Elizabeth Lule, who's the Executive Director of ECDAN, and Howard Taylor, the Executive Director of the Global Partnership to End Violence, to jointly um, share some parting words with us and call to action. Um, th thank you, Shikufte. Um, I'd just like to appreciate all the presenters um, for, for sharing the tools, the resources, the journey from Jamaica to Nepal, um, and the tools um, that Helen shared. Um, I'd like to appreciate um, the partnership with um, Ending Violence Against Children and all the many things that we are working together. Uh, together we're stronger because I think we both have different networks. We're approaching this through the um, early childhood development from um, ending violence against children and uh, bringing the evidence together, the knowledge sharing between countries. I mean, that's what our platforms do and we both want to achieve greater impact. Um, special thanks to Jorge um, for the research that you have done. And uh, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, Knowledge Fellows Program at ECDAN. We have, um, in addition to Jorge, we have four other uh, fellows um, that are working um, on different knowledge uh, products. 
And our knowledge, the ECDAN Knowledge Fellows Program aims to recruit motivated um, young professionals, graduates, and others who are very passionate um, about early childhood development. And uh, we facilitate um, them to develop uh, special knowledge products and learning exchanges through ECDAN's platform. But we also provide an opportunity to build and, and support their career development. The aim is to, to build the new generation of ECD professionals. And we provide and select mentors um, for the fellows as well and other networking um, um, opportunities. We will be, and these five fellows were actually selected um, competitively from over 300 applicants uh, from across the world. We will be um, issuing another call um, in November for new fellows. So please stay tuned. And um, these fellows obviously also contribute um, to the work that ECDAN does. Um, and then I just want to say that uh, with the um, collaborative efforts with the um, Ending Violence Against Children Partnership, we also have another, um, We've come together with the WHO, UNICEF, um, University of Oxford, um, uh, working together um, to establish um, an interagency global vision on parenting um, and how we support parenting. Um, and we issued a call to action, which I hope that um, Shekufe will share. Parenting was hard enough, uh, even before COVID, and COVID-19 has made it so much worse. Um, but our theory of change um, on this global initiative to support parents, we believe that if we combine research from early childhood development, violence prevention, adolescent development, mental health, and uh, new technologies, in partnership with parents, uh, children and adolescents, governments, UN and other multilateral agencies, academics, civil society and donors. And if we agree on the evidence-based parenting programs and pro uh, processes uh, to implement these at population level uh, through digital platforms and other service delivery um, platforms. Uh, and then at country level, we can innovate scale, generate evidence, and advocate together to ultimately bring evidence-based um, coherence in parenting um, to parenting uh, efforts across uh, sectors and across the life course. Um, we can also demonstrate successful scaling of integrated parenting support in national systems and catalyze a global movement to raise awareness of the importance of parenting. Uh, in order to achieve the final goal that parents provide nurturing care to their children and adolescents and protect them in the context of reduced child-related services and increased parental responsibilities. This is the power of, partner of partnering together, and together we can do it. Um, I'll pass on this to Howard, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to work together. Thanks, Elizabeth, uh, and a big thank you to Shekufa uh, and to everyone at ECDAM for, as you say, the power of partnership and for jointly hosting this event today. And of course, also thanks to all of our speakers, Irina, Bears, Jorge, Helen, and Laupura, such powerful um, remarks. And of course, I'd like to thank all participants at the event today. Great to see so many of our partners, our collaborators, and our friends in our shared ambition and mission on corporal punishment. And I'm really struck um, that not only is corporal punishment the most prevalent form of violence against children worldwide, but it is also most commonly used against very young children. And today's presentations from our global experts, we've really heard that uh, from, from experts across the early childhood development, the corporal punishment fields, really highlighting the critical development that takes place during the first five years of life. And they, of course, are foundational for cognitive, neurological, emotional and social development. And we've heard how violence in early childhood has a range of long-term and negative consequences. We heard from Arena about the criticality of nurturing care for young children and from Jorge 
on how the very functioning of the brain can be changed by early violence in childhood. And together, I think this makes a really compelling case for more action, for more investment to tackle corporal punishment and to prevent violence against children in all settings. And therefore, to make sure that children's health, their development, their rights um, are protected, but we also build strong, thriving and peaceful communities. And so in that regard, it was inspiring to also hear about the progress that is being made in countries such as Jamaica and Nepal to end violent punishment in early childhood. Because the good news is that we do have evidence-based solutions to prevent and respond to violence against children. The seven inspire strategies to end violence against children, of course, include the enactment of laws so that children have the same protection from violence that most adults take for granted. And the implementation of those laws is critical, including with a multi-sectoral plan, public education and support for parents and carers. And Elizabeth mentioned just now a bigger, a much bigger parenting initiative, which incorporates this. And in countries which take these steps, we really now are beginning to see a significant decrease in violence against children, as well as wider benefits for the whole of society. And we can take heart from the progress we see happening over the years. 40 years ago, just one country had prohibited corporal punishment. And today, 63 states have issued bans. But of course, I think we would all agree that we need to go further and we need to go faster. And that will include challenging the legal and the social acceptance of corporal punishment, continuing to share evidence about what works, why it works, and why that makes sense from a child's rights, a child health development, and an economic perspective. And we must do all of this in a really compelling and persuasive way that galvanizes the political commitment that's necessary, that kickstarts the legal response that is vital, and prompts the conversation across society to begin to shift the harmful social norms. And we heard just now in the question and answer session, some questions around social norms, around the role of faith and religion, et cetera. And that conversation across society is going to be so critical. So let me finish by saying we call today on governments everywhere to commit to and start that legal process to prohibit corporal punishment in all settings by 2030 and to accelerate the implementation of prohibition. And that includes by making positive parenting support available to all parents and carers and by promoting safe schools and communities which then support children to report, to respond to and recover from violence. And it must all be measured, measure progress by incorporating sustainable development goals 16.2 by one, the proportion of children experiencing corporal punishment into regular national statistical programs. And with our partners, the M Violence Partnership will continue to make the case for action and support every country to tackle corporal punishment as part of wider efforts to make sure that every child grows up safe, secure, and in a nurturing environment. Thank you so much for joining us today. Shakufa, back to you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth and Howard for those excellent motivating remarks. We encourage everyone to join the work, follow the work with both the Global Partnership to End Violence and ECTAN, and we look forward to further collaborations. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Wishing you a good day, evening, night, wherever you are. Bye everyone. And you'll be getting the recordings and everything um, after this session. Thank you, Shikufe and Beth. Thank you.